नमस्ते अरुण जी वेलकम वेलकम टू अहिंसा कॉन्वर्सेशन वॉट इज योर अर्लीस्ट मेमोरी ऑफ अहिंसा एंड आई थॉट particularly in your case because you were about 4 years old at the time of independence how did the uh, being a child living through partition affect your lifelong views or your experience and your understanding of both violence and non violence mm-hmm. well my family was in uh, lahore and uh, 1943 is when i was born uh, on the 15th of august actually 1943 and um, my father at a very young age very entrepreneurial had built a nice factory manufacturing business in uh, outside lahore and uh, he he had the impression given to him as many indians were given the impression that lahore perhaps would most likely be on the indian side of the border and my father was besieged at home and he had to shelter uh, muslims uh, in his house he had a huge house he's by himself my mother and had moved off to shimla because she was expecting a baby with me so we were away and so he was besieged and uh, sort of fighting for the lives of people and his own life and uh, when the border came on the other side of lahore uh, he was uh, sort of smuggled out of an on an plane an air force plane in his shorts and a shirt and something uh, just the day of independence and landed on this side and through all the chaos happening in punjab people going both ways he had to struggle his way up and located uh, my mother they didn't even meet actually but he located her or she located him let's say and uh, then he had to settle himself uh, somewhere where he was given compensation so it was a period of great violence in the family i was 4 years old uh, i have some recollections uh, but i was told so many stories about it by my father his brothers and stuff and um, so i know it was very violent but what i most appreciated about those stories and i now appreciate so much is that he had no rancor he had no rancor uh, certainly he had no rancor against muslims they were um, like part of our family in fact we had a, a young muslim man from the northwest who frontier who was living as a member of the family and my parents had got him educated and he was there going to college so that's the way it was so he had no uh, and neither my mother any feelings about um, any other community it was all like so and the vision of india then that it's a place where everybody muslims and hindus can be together was what they told me that we are like in the place and we're going to build something together in which there will be no violence we we'll live together in harmony and this is mahatma gandhi's dream uh, so the two incidents are said 1948 just before gandhi ji was assassinated my mother at that time was uh, had moved from shimla to to delhi she took me um two or three days before um uh, she says maybe it was the day before uh, gandhi ji was assassinated to his prayer meeting and there as the meeting ended you know everyone rushed to get his blessing and gandhi ji said bring the little children forward so um she sort of push me up and she, she told me and she reminded me about this uh, when she passed away just before she passed away 2 years ago at, at the age of 97 that remember arun gandhi ji has touched you on your head you remember that please always it was and through her life she would uh, uh, give me uh, you know guidance um based on her own life feelings and her impressions and own readings and she's very well read and amongst the things that she kept uh, for me to take after she passed away were some you know her favorite best books which are locked up in a a mirror amongst which as she then showed me also that this is a very special one and I'm keeping it and you will please take it after I pass away which was a uh, Mahatma Gandhi's a uh, autobiography experiments with the truth which it was on the first editions when she was in the lahore college for women and she was doing science and a bsc and she apparently did very well so she was given that as the prize so you can imagine and it's lying with me now behind me here to so so my connections with non violence are through her and through my father and gandhi ji of course arun 
many people took Gandhiji's assassination mm -hmm. as a signal that uh, mm -hmm. the bullet is stronger mm -hmm. than mm -hmm. nonviolence. Mm -hmm. How mm -hmm. did that in any way feature in your childhood that uh, Gandhiji's being murdered, did that reaffirm non-violence or did it undermine it in in your childhood mind? No, it uh, reaffirmed because the way he uh, uh, took it and because he had prepared everybody through all the freedom movement, um, very aware, as Gandhiji was, that uh, violence takes many forms and the structures of society create violence, like for the Dalits. You don't have to be physical in your violence of them. In fact, by neglecting them, there's violence that you're causing uh, and harm to them. Hmm? So uh, coming to my professional life, uh, yes, I joined uh, the Tatars uh, just as I finished college. And, um, well, this Gandhi uh, inspiration in my life was there already. And the Tatars were a more kindly uh, institution uh, than uh, most others. Um, and certainly more kindly than any business institution. So when you talk about you know, business, the violence that business does uh, to societies, the Tatas are probably an example of less violence. The, the, the usual picture we have of violence is uh, you know, physical violence um, and uh, you know, using physical violence to, uh, uh, to uh, right wrongs, or to get what one wants. Uh, and that is what, uh, as um, well, let's say, let's say Mahatma Gandhi again said, we shouldn't have to use, we must not use violence to right wrongs. We must find non-violent means of uh, rectifying historical wrongs uh, and wrongs that we may perceive uh, presently in any situation. And the discovery of uh, uh, the invention, uh, to using in his terms, uh, I mean, I describe Mahatma Gandhi in my mind always as the world's greatest technology innovator. The technology that he was innovating was a, a process of uh, making things happen uh, in uh, a very uh, efficient way. Uh, efficient meaning there's no harm caused, there's no cost involved, physical cost involved, and you produce an outcome, which is a definition of efficiency, I guess. Hmm? Um, so, uh, and I want to insist on this because you keep talking nowadays about innovation and saying, you know, the social media is an innovation and the use of digital technologies is innovation. Hmm? And we run away from uh, the, the problem that social technologies are causing, this innovative technology are causing a lot of violence. And, and the violence they're causing is to people's beings. Because the way people are talked about, there's a positive violence caused to them. And there's a negative violence also when they're not included in a discourse, which is... Uh, real violence against the being of a person that you don't even exist for us. You're completely outside. And this relates to uh, Gandhiji's uh, 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 you know, concern for um, uh, the marginalized people, and marginalized not just economically, but in India, like the uh, Harijans. They're completely marginalized uh, in our minds and thinking also. They're outside, not even marginalized. They're completely outside it. And so the violence that we cause to the beings of others uh, in uh, the way we uh, do not relate to them, or as I said also earlier, the way we relate to them and engage them, uh, let's apply these ideas to the non-physical space of discourse. Of discourse. And uh, here, um, um, I early on in uh, uh, my career, um, when I was uh, you know, concerned about uh, how we were in um, Tatars uh, working together um, and not working together very effectively, I felt in creating something which would be for all of us good and for the country also, that we were in our uh, you know, passion to do good for the country, to produce something very innovative were amongst ourselves causing violence to each other and to our social system. Now, how was this? It was the way that uh, um, uh, superiors talked to their juniors. The word would come inferiors, but that's almost the way you thought about them, you know, that I have the right to talk to you like this. 
because it is for the sake of a larger good hmm? so in talking to the person in that way you were expecting that person to believe that you are superior and the person is inferior hmm? and that is the greatest violence that you can cause to a person's being as i said so it's in the way you spoke to somebody the way you instructed somebody the way you corrected somebody that you were causing violence and so i found experiments uh, which were uh, out in the social sciences at that time showing that if in a discourse between people a person feels that uh, he or she has been put down means some sarcastic remark made or the person's uh, intelligence so sharply questioned um, that the person himself also realizes my goodness uh, everyone can everyone can see how weak or wrong i was um these experiments were done you know like they do most of these uh, social sciences or uh, behavioral science experiments by putting these sensors onto people onto their minds or their bodies and seeing how the uh, instruments show the reactions the um by the pulses that come out the reactions that the um when these were instruments put onto the arms of people in the course of discussions in um business settings in uh, uh, social settings that when a person was uh, very sharply put down you know in, in a way very uh, intelligently made fun of the um reaction that the person had in the body was the same as if that person had been slapped physically very hard the response in the body was exactly the same so i began to then explore what are better ways of having discourse amongst people which is non violent to arrive at a truth collectively arrive at a truth now this is the essence of if you will a democratic process hmm? collectively arrive at a truth collectively arrive at a truth and if um, we want to find a truth which is the truth regarding the condition of a very complex system then many perspectives have to be considered it's like the blind man around an elephant so many people have to be heard have to be heard and uh, it doesn't matter if the poor fellow is just you know handling the tail which is a very important part of the elephant and the person handling the trunk says you know i am the most important and let me keep speaking because this is going to explain the whole elephant to you the other person saying actually even the tail is going to help us to understand and there's a function to it too what this whole elephant is about so please listen to me too um so we don't do this uh, in our democratic discourse like today with the farmers out i mean we treat them as they don't understand economics and they don't understand what the benefit of of uh, free trade is and uh, free markets are and so hmm? and so the only way they can come out is to as you we will say well uh, if it's a revolution where they cause some physical violence to other people's properties and and bodies to be heard to be heard hmm? and if we don't want that to happen we do want to hear them because we won't understand the condition of the whole system unless we hear them so we have to change the character of the discourse where everybody is heard uh, um, and doesn't feel put down and feels that um, i'm being respected my point of view is being equally respected yes it may be about a small part of the system but it's very important to me and i must be heard and when you reverse it and say i have to master my art of listening to another that's the the least violence that you can cause another actually allowing another and i'm using like gandhi ji you know use a lati on me and i'm going to learn to take it and to learn something from it so you know you speak and by what you say i will discover some elements of the objective truth i will also discover second thing is why you feel so angry i'll begin to learn about your condition and if i can just bite my tongue and listen i learn something about myself mm-hmm. i learn about how i have preconceived notions about mm-hmm. that you couldn't be knowing anything for example or that what you know you know um uh, is is wrong so the power of listening to be brought into discourse now in the case of debating the one person is listening to another for sure but just to find the weakness in the other person's argument yeah, ultimately it's to the point of winning something in uh, let me call it again democratic deliberation there's no winners actually and people are nowadays using this whole thing but there be no winners but the point is not to have a winner 
the yeah. point is we all have to win together <laughs> arun can you give an illustration in yes, say in uh, particularly over the last 10 years somewhere uh, yes, yes, of yes. a case in which you were able to apply this with the degree of uh, satisfaction See, the context was that india uh, we felt some of us in, uh, in 2000 uh, we began to recognize that the way india was growing after the the reforms of 1991 uh, hadn't uh, really improved mm-hmm. the conditions in fact was creating inequalities you see this was the sense of it it was creating inequalities hmm? yes there was growth and there was celebration but there was inequalities that were becoming visible some of us were realizing that the uh, uh, effects the unintended consequences perhaps of the growth and the improvement of uh, products with technology and uh you know the market being allowed to operate was the um, inequalities that were being created yes economists measure that but more than that being became sensitive to that we are not listening anymore to people not like ourselves whose condition is not the same as ours and we are not listening anymore to them so with this backdrop we said let's create a process where we will invite such people into the same room as us and let's listen to them if you are listened to your dignity is given to you so that impoverishment of uh, the indignity uh, is uh, you know you're restored that's one thing second is as we said to understand the situation of the system from all perspectives and then to find a good solution policy yeah is that's how the poverty will be removed so unless you listen to the poor people you can't even find the objective solutions uh, to to poverty so we attempted to do this and we couldn't obviously get the whole institution of india to change to say well you will not write a plan in the usual way that there will not be 10 chapters one on urban and one on this i mean you have to do what is presently being done and modify it gradually you can't replace it and throw it off imagine if we had said we abolish planning altogether and the government altogether now we're going to have conversations yeah <laughs> we were thrown out of the place even gandhi ji with his great uh, uh, acceptance by everybody couldn't get rid of the government and after he died we had this big planning commission installed on us because it seemed to be the way to do things so we did start on the side it was said that why don't you then do it on the side why have a parallel show small process in which you listen to the people in this mode that you're suggesting and then structured process and um so firstly within the planning commission itself there are what to 80 officers and they were in about 30 different departments or silos or divisions they never would talk to each other you see they wouldn't even go to each other's rooms i mean they send notes to each other so where was the listening and the conversation even amongst those people or to make one plan for all of india no conversations hmm? uh, no deliberations and so we first got them together in uh, the agriculture institute after giving them a lot of exercise of making them do another department's job for a few weeks saying this is a problem but now you are going to be making a case for that department's plan with respect to this matter hmm? put yourself in another person's shoes and then for two and a half days at the agriculture institute over a weekend we got these people to present what they had learned and their thoughts to each other and they said they've never done this we've never even within the planning commission had a non violent let me use the word <laughs> discourse because all their discourses otherwise were really violent and in writing you can be brutal as you know because you don't even have to face the other person to do that so here it was listening to people non violently from that they realized that we would need to have um some system of listening to many more people outside so saida hamid and myself we said let's find out who are the people who are in touch with uh, common people and civil society organizations are there so we have a record in the planning commission of some there were 1000 registered or something more than that you know civil society organization used to come and ask for projects and this and that and the other so we uh, invited them all to say we've got eight or nine questions about uh, what this country should be and how it could become that which have come out of our 230 persons discourse amongst the planning commission we want you to first tell us whether we got the right questions and uh, if some of them are right then please tell us how you think 
uh, we should go about together with you in um, uh, solving these problems. And so we learned there, uh, Rajni, that uh, the civil society people who claim to be uh, listening to the people were, if I could use the word, even worse than us. You see, they were very good at representing what they believe uh, the people want. I'm not saying for everybody, but a large number of them. These are the activists that you see. Yeah. And I'm saying so. So the activists are causing violence to other people's beings. I mean, you will insult the other person, you will make the other person look uh, cruel and evil and so, right? On behalf of, of course, those poor people who are not being heard. So the method you're using, I'm going to say here, is a non-violent, is a violent method. Now remember Gandhiji, as he said, even about the British, he was never going to, even in the words, yeah, he said, just respect. I mean, they are by their history who they are. Hmm? The total action is evil. Yeah. But I'm not against any individual human being there. Yeah, I'm not against any individual human being, as a human being uh, there. So we um, found from the civil society activists that many amongst them were not like this also that they really were listening to people. And interestingly, the ones who were listening to people were not out on the street shouting on behalf of the people. So amongst the civil society organizations, there was a big division that some of them who were actually doing the work, as you say, people who are creating results on the ground by working with the people, were thought of as by these others as weak, that they become compliant in the system. We are the strong people. Now, look at the word strong. But strong sort of in the mind implies that you're going to do something which I'm going to slip into violent. <laughs> yeah, it's visible, it's noisy. It, it, it shakes things up. Um, and then egos come in. And, and, you know, once your ego comes in, your temptation to destroy the ego of another, because that is what the competition is now all about. And there's where the violence starts, the violence amongst the, you know, yeah. the egos. And, and so, Rajni, um, uh, I, this is a lot, but I'm saying I could talk for a long time. They've written about it, about what we learned about uh, um, the difficulties of listening to people not like ourselves uh, as, as, as individuals. Uh, we don't have that uh, uh, facility usually, and we must develop it. And then collectively, when all of us are learning that we must uh, you know, bite our tongues and allow others to uh, say uh, what they believe, uh, then how can we make this process uh, efficient in the sense that you can't listen to you know 1.2 billion people and keep listening to them? There has to be some ways of uh, concluding within a reasonable period of time, say a few months or something, that about this matter at least, we seem to be aligned. We don't need to discuss it any further. We are into action already in this matter. Yeah. Arun, in this, uh, to, to wrap up on this discussion, how do you now looking back on all this very rich work, um, tally your successful experiences in deep listening with the fact that the macroeconomic structural violence in many ways has become much worse. You have spoken about that earlier. So, uh, and I... So I already know from what you've told me that deep listening remains important, nevertheless. Yes. But in what ways can it help us going forward to really undo the, uh, the, the structural violence of the macroeconomic system? Any, any, any clues on that? Yes, uh, Rajni, I'm just uh, reading uh, James Scott's uh, book about uh, uh, the peasant... Um, they weren't uprisings, but the uh, uh, present resistance against the uh, agricultural green revolution reforms in Malaysia in the 1970s at the same time as we were having our green uh, revolution uh, uh, in India. And uh, as he does very well, I mean, he's um, uh, an anthropologist um, and political scientist, and he lived there for three years during that time. And he observed, like an anthropologist would, uh, what was the process going on? And the process is not what government announcements and all are. It's, it's what's happening in the society. Hmm? 
there were already things happening for 100 years before that there were structures of uh, uh, the economy there i mean someone owned land someone worked on the land and there were some systems of paying the people who were working and who didn't have the land and etc etc so there's an economic structure there in which there was injustice i mean i mean it's not that the uh, feudal structures which have been replaced by the market were more just than the market structures are I mean, there was injustice there too so he uh, goes on to that and then of course um, he talks about uh, ramishi and uh, the people who written about marxist revolutions and so on that you know the, the need to change um, uh, a system is felt time to time historically in particular places and uh, change is brought about and history writes about the the revolutionary ones because you know they make a big splash there's a big noise there's a lot of violence and and harm so it's noted and so in history we record Uh, change being brought about violently wars and and violence the changes that are brought about without violence they don't make history because it's boring you know it's it's boring it's boring hmm? and so uh, he does go into the discussion about uh, uh, whether um, ideological structures like uh, a structure that uh, you need to have god and then god will lay down the rules or you need to have a king and the king will make sure this peace and harmony etc this is a top down management uh, and it's a, an idea and it seems to prevail continues to prevail also um is this uh, has to be there forever hmm? forever um and we have tried as you know we say democracy we try and change this idea and say no we don't need to have someone who's given uh, the dictator authority whether god or otherwise and we can all govern uh, together um so from this came to me as he's saying that the there's no constant idea permanent natural idea of governance of a society hmm? okay the only constant as we keep saying is change human beings begin to feel injustice and what was previously considered just as a civilization a sense of civilization advances we feel that too is unjust and that too should be improved like women's rights i mean for a long time it was accepted that it's a natural order they are women after all and produce children etc you know and so it's natural that uh, the men should uh, have the say but now we say no 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 that's so so we're changing governance structures even family structures because we've got a deeper sense of justice now a deeper sense of justice as we are advancing so there's no god given structure of a social system there may be a god given structure of a natural system the physical system but even that evolves as we notice <laughs> it does not remain the same so the only constant is change and evolution so okay now in the case of human institutions which are economic institutions also some of them economic institutions are up they are all social institutions how do we change these so i come back to again these are created by us yeah yeah uh, i had more charge of uh, imposing them and others were compliant at that stage and accepted by by their behavior thereafter it became the institution if they hadn't behaved in conformance with the new thing it wouldn't have been the institution so everybody has been a participant in it except that some have had it if you will imposed on them others were thought of as intelligent and and given the power and they did it to them and this is the idea i don't like because i say the fundamental human thing is every person must feel i have an equal say and right in how our society and economy is constructed regarding that i must an equal say so the conversation about uh, the governance and the reforms that is what we have to change so i gave you those models of yeah. uh, the buffalo for example i mean that's the usual modes we use we have to invent this other way we described it in paper in our constitution that it is to be you know everybody will be its governance by the people but how and i'm saying if it's governance by the people about institutions that we have created together then the conversation about that must be done the conversation itself must be democratic and mm. by democratic i'm defining that, mm? Mm. that so, everybody should be included so even in a situation where many people are today feeling more disheartened than before about this approach you are still confident that we can make this work that's 
uh, what is yes, the yes, yes, source yes. of your confidence that in against all odds that this approach uh, no, I know it's strange uh, rajni um, um, uh, i came back to as i said the 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 the, the four models of change that uh, emerged out of the very lovely um, a very um, uh, discourse amongst a very diverse sets of people in 2000 one was the fireflies are rising like i mentioned to you yeah and so so th- how did that come about we observed it's actually happening in large numbers but we do not take advantage of it that we've got an idea this energy there yeah let's support that energy rather than trying to create other energies and more powerful institutions um which can change the whole system so similarly on this thing about a, a democracy which is uh, at the bottom of the pyramid which is amongst people in the communities creating change um i can see this is carrying on and now there are many people young people and some older people who are saying we've got to change the way democracy is functioning it's not about the economy it's the way democracy is functioning and this idea that let's get off just trying to amend the constitution any further we got already too much in the constitution let's start getting to the essence of democracy it's a deliberative democracy that we need to have not electoral democracy and improvement of institutions as part of the electoral democracy let's improve our processes of deliberation let's improve those and so since so many of these younger people are doing this and they're trying to make these into movements it's an idea and i find this is where the challenge comes even now people say oh but you know that softy softy unless you do something hard it won't happen and here rajni there are large civil society organizations in the country and you know those people too and they have been very concerned the last uh, one year about how civil society organizations are being clamped down upon but what is their solution they want to put together a big people to sign up something to make some amendments to the constitution to require that civil society organizations will be funded by the government and i say crazy right it's like business saying to the government and they are you better make life easy for us because we are good for the people so now you a civil society are saying to the government put it in the constitution because we are good for the people do the people think so have you asked the people this i go back to what we learned in the planning commission that you know please remain as a servant of the people please don't jump up too soon and say i am your representative <laughs> don't take the position upon yourself let them speak and if in the part of that they ask you occasionally to underline something that they have said or give them the language for them to speak please do that facilitation but don't become their leader their neta here don't yeah. because then you will cause violence hmm, on you, in your relationship with them hmm. but uh, arun do you feel do you still have hope of business shifting to a triple bottom line approach in any substantial way cannot i told you this uh, rajni that we discussed the last time business as an institution so long as all of us in society have defined the purpose of a business institution to use material energy resources efficiently and produce surpluses out of it okay this we say efficient they efficient we've defined that then please don't expect the people who run those institutions to do anything else i mean that is the dharma it's been given to them to do on our behalf and also then if in the measurement if we give so much primacy to how much surplus in money terms is being produced because that is the measure that we know then that's what they're going to use So yes there will be people who on the side will do some things and talk about some good things in the village here or some movement that they support but that's not going to have a big impact so you have to develop new institutional forms and so therefore i'm very much into uh, suggesting that uh, um, we need to create social economic enterprises economic social enterprises which are uh, the the gandhian model kumarapa gandhian model of you know cooperatives owned by the producers because i'm just writing about are, that you yes, have been writing yes. about the need to redefine value yes 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 and you can redefine the value but you have to the means of then creating that value therefore i come to the institution design so that institution is then run on democratic capitalist principles and i have been speaking when people say gandhi ji was anti capitalist i said no in my interpretation of gandhi ji's vision he wanted india to be a country of we didn't think of a billion but let's say a billion democrats 
and half a billion capitalists <laughs> because these were going to be people who own their own enterprise it was their capital you see so don't say that and when people say about uh, you're a socialist i said no i don't like the word socialism either because we tend to think about socialist as something to do like the soviet union where the people didn't own their own enterprise frankly some bureaucrats gave the decisions of the enterprise how were they taking decisions about their own enterprise and yes the surplus wealth was being put into some other people up there who then chose how to spend it coming back to the planning commission idea so neither was that democratic nor is capitalism democratic in its business institutions has there been any uh, context in which you have applied these methods to this hindu muslim question um i mean in no, any, even directly. in an informal setting no not directly a uh, hindu muslim directly it has been as part of larger now this is something also i have learned uh, rajni and this i'm learning that if you take any particular issue and make it like we versus them almost it will come up when you put hindu and muslim right now versus them if you enlarge it and saying this same phenomena is happening with a few others also hmm? so coming down to what we need to do towards each other not on this particular matter but towards each other so yes like going back even to 2000 and certainly into the time of the planning commission with saida hamid and you know saida quite well and she's naturally i mean her job was to do women's and the minority affairs in the planning commission so the issue of uh, the dalits and and muslims and a lot to do with muslim she kept bringing into it and so we had the muslim issue and the dalit issue along with the women's issue let's take three of them and the three very oppressed communities huh? <laughs> and when you take it out into them together uh, then it becomes uh, for everyone to understand how they are complicit in it because i cannot be i'm saying so good towards muslim if i'm being bad towards dalits so vice versa or i'm saying this is what i say to my neo liberal friends if i am being so brutally violent to the being of people who are to our mind uneducated you know so purely looking down on them i'm sorry the sort of solution we have for the hindu muslim problem is going to be again an intellectual sort of solution it is not going to enable all of us to accept others as they are and so start with that and this is what the his holiness the dalai lama wrote in the forward to my book very well he said the whole buddhist thing it says you know, first he says the first um wisdom tool of buddhism is listening and i didn't know this i thought it was compassion and i thought it was something else and empathy he said no unless you deeply listen you cannot understand and how can you have any empathy and compassion and unless you deeply listen you will not find a question to which you don't have an answer and if you don't have a question to which you don't have an answer you will not learn and you mentioned one aspect that you know there is a brutality and the democracy is going down but there are many movements there are people who are like the farmers movement for incomes and the farmers movement and needs are not uniform across the country as i've learned because i've been spending time i mean what farmers need in kerala is quite different to what the farmers need in punjab and what the farmers need anywhere else and in all these places like the farmers of punjab there is an environmental issue also but the different issues in environment in other places so we need local up movements which will take care of this other economic violence and the political violence which is the stilling of the voices of people but as the farmers protest just now is demonstrating there is a dilemma that if one side is doing agraha satya ka agraha satyagraha and they feel unheard by the powers that be then where does the quest for non violence go innovations again always and gandhi ji uh, is has been the greatest innovator of uh, how to change the conditions of uh, societies the idea of non violence and how to apply non violence the principle of non violence in various situations it had to be applied depending on the situation yeah but always it's non violence and uh, uh, so we went on and this was the principle and there were methods so yeah he invented the methods and you know you can take and imitate the method if you like but sit down don't eat hunger strike you know do violence to yourself but don't do violence to the other at all and so the people have imitated those parts and whether it's 
Martin Luther King in one place and others, and they've all bowed to this great innovator of social political change. That's Mahatma Gandhi. Now, I was reading uh, this lovely book just now, rereading it. It's called The Politics of Small Things. Oh, okay. The Politics of Small Things. I wonder if you read it. Who was it by? It, Jeffrey Goldfarb. Jeff, Jeffrey Goldfarb. The okay. Power of the Powerless in Dark Times. So he's not talked about India because he's talking about Eastern Europe after the Soviet times or during those times. And the American movements have changed with recently the black movements and more democratic movements where, you know, the power is with the people who fund the party. So, yeah, these are all the structures that cause the violence against small people. So it's about the power of the powerless in dark times. But the sentence at the end is uh, two sentences. It is very important to realize that it is the means of opposing more than the short-term realization of the ends that is most crucial. Because this is Gandhiji's whole thing. Yeah. That it's the being, it's the means, and not the end that you would get by violence. Because you already, if you become violent, you've lost the end that you want to be, the harmonious yeah. society that yes. you want to be. Yeah. So there will be innovations required. There will right. be innovations. I mean, at that time, it was another issue and there were no tractors, maybe, and etc. <laughs> so, Arun, in closing, what advice yeah. you, would you give to young people today who want to tread this path, but they sometimes feel daunted by the larger circumstances in which they are living? So what are some of yeah. the things that they can do in their everyday life or in their professional life, uh, you know, which would make them feel empowered to stay on this path? Well, I um, have, you know, fortunately, in this way I'm blessed and I don't feel at all uh, hopeless or helpless by the young people who are doing something already, not just they want to, they're already doing it. And they want to reflect or they want to do even better. Hmm? And so they come and talk and I just listen to them. And then it comes back always to these Threes and threes. I'll tell you what the threes and threes are. One is the definition of leadership. That a leader, she or he, who takes the first steps towards something that she or he deeply cares about and in ways that others will wish to follow, not be commanded to follow, that they will wish to follow. So something that you deeply care about. I said it starts with that. And these young people, of course, that's why they are there. They care about something. And all of these people that I get to meet are not caring about building a $1 billion unicorn. They're caring about the condition of society. So just a reflection again, reminding them what it is that they're trying to create. What would the world feel like to them and to others if they achieve that vision? And they keep saying to me that, you know, this is so important that we keep forgetting where we are going. It's the goal. And at least these people do it more frequently. But when I find young business people who say, you know, I'm fed up with, I want to give back. Then I ask them, what do you most deeply care about? No, they haven't thought of that. They just know that they're frustrated with what they're doing. And I say, but sit down and reflect. What is it you care about? And in the caring about, also start thinking about the means. Yeah? What I care for, like in these cases of the young people, they invariably say, I want not to harm anybody while we are trying to achieve success. It's not by revolution. I want it by some evolution. So there's a principle already. Okay, but that's hard. It turns out to be hard, like you're saying. I said, that is where now you're going to take the first steps, do the innovative steps that no one else has taken. Leaders are those who do things first before others have done them, like Mahatma Gandhi did. So figure out what is it you're going to do. And when you ask me best practice, I don't know. Because I can tell you what Mahatma Gandhi did because I've read it or what I did in my own life, but there are different circumstances. You in your look at reality, and that was something again with Mahatma Gandhi. Or, anyway, I, in strategy, you teach people, just first listen to reality. And that's why I come back to listening. Until you have listened to everybody, you don't know the forces that are lurking inside, which could be negative or which could be following you. I'm saying people who wish to follow you. Hmm? They would be partners in this journey. So listen, 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 and you will find you take the first steps towards what you care about. And if you've been listening, you probably already are acting towards what other people care about because become part of your being also. And they know now, like Mahatma Gandhi, that you know he's fighting for our freedom and not for his greatness. That's wonderful. Thank you so much for making the time.
and all the best to you radni and thank you very much for inviting uh, me to this